And thank you to the choir for that beautiful song. That's the first time I've ever heard the choir sing live. I've heard them on YouTube for the Christmas cantatas, but that was the first time. So that was, a, that was special for me. How's everyone doing today? You guys sound like you're sleepy. You guys, uh, you guys okay? You guys awake? All right. Well, I have some uh, good news in case you don't know. Two Sabbaths ago, we had our baby. So our fourth and final. I'll pro- prophesy that right now. But I uh, just want to thank God for another miracle in our, in our family. And uh, the baby's name is Malana. And she's doing really well. She's eating well, sleeping well, <laughs> pooping well. <laughs> so you know she's very healthy. And uh, so that's where my wife is. She's, she's at home. And she's watching our service, I'm sure. But anyway, uh, so we're, we're very helpful, uh, very, very happy, very thankful to God for, for another uh, uh, addition to our family, but also very thankful to you. Um, there was so much love sent our way, and I, I'm sure that we're trying to say thank you to everyone, but I'm sure we might miss one or two along the way. So just in case, we, you don't know this, we don't intend to not say thank you to you for, for all the love that you guys have shown for us. You know, I've rediscovered something. I've rediscovered the most beautiful smell in the entire world. You know what that smell is? Thank you, Jacob. That's my son right there. Baby's breath. You guys ever smell baby's breath? Man, next time you have a baby and they yawn, put your nose right there, right there in their mouth, okay? And just smell that beautiful, beautiful, the most precious smell, most pure smell in the entire world is baby's breath. Right? I was thinking this week, man, what happened to our breath? <laughs> you know, as we get older, as we go older, it's no longer beautiful baby's breath. We wake up in the morning, it's more like dragon's breath. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, we're, we're, we're very, uh, very blessed and uh, we're tired, uh, especially my wife, but, but, we're, but we're blessed uh, beyond uh, words, so... Uh, let's, let's, let's pray one more time for God's blessing. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that as you be with us, uh, that you would be with us now, that your words would be spoken here uh, today. Lord, move me out of the way so this message could become loud and clear. And Lord, I just pray that you would anoint this congregation today. May we be alive in your spirit uh, to hear the words of God here today. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I was going to do this uh, series next year to the start of next year. I was going to do this series called The Gospel in Revelation. I was going to start the year next year with it. But last weekend, something happened to me. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, we moved from Florida uh, six weeks ago uh, to here. And, but last weekend, they were going through what we probably all know as they were going through Hurricane Irma. And just to be honest, I was physically here last Sabbath. But my heart and my mind were with uh, my family and my friends who were there, many of whom still don't have power. And it's 90-something degrees in Florida right now. So you can imagine how hot it is, what they're going through. And last weekend, I just, I, I, I was really, my heart was there, and I was just really thinking about the people. And, uh, you know, we were, there was a lot of talk about the end time, about all these storms and all these things. And, man, I just, I just really had a sense and conviction that I was not supposed to do this series next year, that I'm supposed to do it right now. And so we're going to start an eight-part series today on the gospel and revelation. And uh, so we're going to start today, and I hope you guys get used to kind of what we're going to do, and we're going to, uh, as we get started here today, uh, we'll, we'll talk about why even that we're talking about this. My favorite author says this in Gospel Workers, page 148. She says, Ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith. The prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be carefully studied, and in connection with them, the words, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So two things came up to me when I saw this quote. Two things came up to me. Number one, Glenn, talk about Revelation now. This is what people are thinking about. This is what's in their mind. So talk about it now. And number two is when we talk about Revelation, let's talk about it in the way that she says that we should talk about it. That when we hear, when people hear the Revelation, they shouldn't think about anything else, but they should behold the Lamb of God. That they should see Jesus in the book of Revelation. 
that, that uh, you know, maybe there's a challenge for, for, for us uh, who have heard Revelation. Maybe you've heard the book of Revelation and maybe you leave those messages or, or, or maybe those series thinking of the beast. Or maybe you think about, you, you leave that thing about the 144,000. Who are the 144,000? Or, or maybe you think of, of the mark or, 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 or anything else. But Hinsdale Philam, please let's be clear about this. The book of Revelation is not about the beast. It's not about the 144,000. It's not even about the mark. The book of Revelation, she says it, is about Jesus Christ. And so whenever you see the book of Revelation, whenever you hear a message, please, please expect to get a clearer understanding and a clearer glimpse of our Savior. And so when we talk about that, we talk about it in this way that I pray, I pray is going to lift up Jesus Christ. That when you leave this place, you really understand who Jesus is. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, the very first verse in Revelation says who Revelation is, 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 is all about, who Revelation is revealing. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, the very first words in the book of Revelation says it's the revelation or the revealing of Jesus Christ. Let's not miss that, church. Let's not ever miss that. This is about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Are we clear on that? All right, now we can go. Now we can uh, go forward. So this is about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let me get just a, 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 just a quick review uh, for you from the book of Revelation. Revelation has three sections. If you're a note taker, you can take this down. Sorry about that. If you're a note taker, please take this down. The, the first section of Revelation, chapters 1 through 11, is from the time... That Jesus leaves, he starts the church to the time of the end. That's chapters 1 through 11. Chapters 12 to 14, right in the middle of it. It's a very special three chapters. It's the time of the end to the time of judgment. And then we have a third and special section. This is where we're going to start here in our series. And we're going to finish off uh, pretty much the year with an eight-part series. And it's, it's chapters 15 to 22 all the way to the end. And it's the time of judgment all the way till the New Jerusalem descends. So three major sections. And just kind of for your in, info, and, and you know kind of where we're, where we're at in the book of Revelation. We're starting at the climax. This is the end of not just Revelation. As you know, this is the end of the entire Bible. This is the bang. Right here. This is it. This is, this is how the Bible ends. And we're going to talk about that here today. We're going to finish the year off with the way Revelation finishes. And I have, uh, I have some bad news for you. Are you excited about hearing bad news? I have some bad news, but, but just hang in there because the bad news is actually also good news. Depending on how you see it. And here's the bad news. It's just four words right here. The end is near. See, this is the bad news, but it's also the good news. Right? So we see storms, (laughs) and we've seen uh, earthquakes. What else? We see wars in 2017. We see rumors of war in 2017. We see pestilences, and we see all these things happening in 2017. Even people that don't follow the Bible, are saying and they're feeling these kind of things, that something's happening in the world, something's about to happen, the end is near. Do you guys believe that today? And so whether you believe this and whether you are prepared, it's either good news or it's bad news for you. Hopefully today, this is good news for you. Amen? Amen? That the promise that the end is near, hopefully this is good news for you today. Whether we're ready or not is if this is good news or bad news. And so let's jump to Revelation chapter 15. Uh, hopefully you have your Bibles with me today. We're going to do a little bit of a, of a study in Revelation 15. And I want you to see it. But we'll also read it together, Revelation chapter 15. And we're going to start with verse 2. And if you're there, say amen. 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 Starting with verse 2. When I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory... Over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship 
before you. Now, Revelation 15, it starts with this awesome picture, a picture of this immense crowd. And they're gathering in front of what, church? I want to make sure you're with me. They're, they're gathering in front of what? The sea of glass, okay? They're gathering in front of this sea of glass, and they're singing this particular song. And the song is entitled what in Revelation 15? It's called what? Song of Moses and the Lamb. Song of Moses and the Lamb. Now, have you ever wondered what that, what that song is? Have you ever wondered what that song is? That song of Moses and the Lamb? Have you ever wondered what it is? Well, let me tell you, whenever there's a question in Revelation that you want to know and you want to have a deeper understanding of what Revelation is saying, there's a biblical um, um, way of interpretation that Adventists practice, and this is very biblical, and I praise God for that, but here it is, right here. If you want to understand something about the Bible, where do you go? Besides asking the Holy Spirit. Where do you go? If you have a question about the Bible, where do you go? Someone tell me, please. Yeah, you guys got it. You guys, you guys got it. So, so if you have a question in the Bible, you go to the Bible. But specifically, if you have a question in Revelation, where do you go? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, let me tell you. Revelation, Revelation has more Old Testament references than any other New Testament book. Revelation, if it, if it wasn't for the Old Testament, we couldn't understand Revelation. And so, yes, it's Daniel, and someone said Exodus, but, but to, to, uh, to, spread, to spread it out, to spread out the, the whole message of Revelation, there's much in Isaiah, there's much in Ezekiel, there obviously is in Daniel, but it's the, entire, it's the entire Old Testament. If we have a question in Revelation, we go to the Old Testament. Amen? Are we clear? Yeah. I have a friend, I have a very good friend, by the way. Uh, he, I, fish, I used to fish with him. He was in, in Florida. And he'd always tell me this. Always tell me. I'm a New Testament Christian. Not one word in the Old Testament has anything to speak to me. And I would never argue with him because I, I, I've read in, in, our, in our message that it, arguing doesn't do any good. So we would talk. We'd have friendly conversations. And we would talk about these things. But man, church, we have to understand, and I hope you already do, and hopefully this is just repetition for you, but we have to understand that we can't understand the New Testament without the Old Testament. The New Testament is based on the Old Testament. Fact, matter of fact, we don't even have grounds to believe that Jesus is the Messiah if it wasn't for the Old Testament. Amen? Amen. So when we refer to the Old Testament, we refer to the Scriptures, and we know that we can build an understanding about Revelation from the Old Testament. You guys with me? We're doing a little Bible study here. I hope you guys don't mind. And then we're going to get to, I pray, the, 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 the point here so that you can see what this is talking about. So what is the Song of Moses? Well, if we could, I bet, I bet if we could go to the Old Testament, I bet we can find out what the Song of Moses is. And Uncle just said it. Exodus chapter 15. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me, because I didn't put it, actually put it up there. So you have Revelation 15, and then you have Exodus 15. If you're a note taker, um, you can write this down and look at it later. But I'm just, I'm just going to read the first two verses in Exodus chapter 15. Please remember, Exodus chapter 15, here's the song of Moses. And this is what the Word of God says. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. What's the song of Moses? It's the song of salvation. It's the song of victory. Children of Israel just got out, just crossed the Red Sea. They came out of Egypt, and they're all gathered together. What do they do? What do they do? In response to their salvation, what do they do? They sing. The only response to how good God is, the only response to giving thanks to God, church, is to sing. And so they sang the song of Moses. That's the song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15. Now, I just want to say a uh, brief side note, but it's a very important side note. Ever since we came here, and if my wife is watching, she would confirm this. Ever since we came here, let me tell you, we have been so blessed to see and hear you all sing. I'll tell you, I get to sit right here and I get to hear you all behind me and those leading in the front. And when I hear you all sing and I know that 
God is moving us to sing with all of our hearts. Let me tell you, that is such a blessing. And we love it. There are, there are people that watch on, on live stream from our old churches, and they look and they tell us continually, man, I love worshiping with you guys. Like, that church can sing. And I say, praise God for that. Amen? I want to thank all those who work so, so much to, to, to make sure that our, that our music is excellent and it's Christ-centered and, and, that, and that it has a message. Because, you know, after 14 years of, of, of ministry, I want to say that I've come to the conclusion that the message, especially these days, the message is just as important as the, the I'm sorry, the music is just as important as the message these days, especially when the music contains the message. And so it, it, it's such a gift to be able to sing together as a church. Let's not take that for granted. And whenever we come together and we have a song to sing, we have a reason to sing because Christ has given us salvation, because Christ has given us victory, let's sing with all of our hearts. Amen? Amen? You know, I feel like the greatest things about the Filipino culture is, and those of you who didn't grow up in the culture, maybe you guys have seen this already, I believe they are twofold. One, we love music. Like, you, you get the, get the best karaoke singers in the world, man. <laughs> but we love music. We love to sing. And we're, we're, we're not, I, did, I, sh- I should say this very humbly, but we're probably the most hospitable people in the world. We're the warmest people in the world. Come on now. Yes. That's, why, that's why the cruise ships hire us. <laughs> right? And so, so if you put music and you put warmth and hospitality together, and then you top that off with the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, let me tell you, that's why we're here, guys. That's why we're here. You put those things together. And then, and, and, and then we become a group that's not, not exclusive and not excluding anyone. And you welcome everybody into these doors. Man, God's going to do something here. I believe it. You guys believe it? Yes. And, and you know, I, I look at this verse also in Revelation 15. One thing I noticed as I was looking at it, they're not just standing at the sea of glass. Um, but they're, they're, and they're, they're just singing a song. But they're also doing something else. They're standing they're standing and they're singing. You know, I think this is very important. There's just some songs that, that, that you just can't sit down for. You know, we, we stand up for the national anthem, right? We, 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 we even kind of look down at people who don't stand up. We, we stand up when, when we hear, Sorry, my, my Tagalog's not so sharp. But, but you know, we, we, hear, we hear those songs and it makes us stand. You know, I believe, I, I truly believe, with all of my heart, when I think of the day Christ comes for His people, I truly believe that we're going to be not only outside, but we're going to be standing, and we're going to be looking, and we're going to be, we're going to be raising our hands, and welcoming our Savior, welcoming our King of Kings. Yeah. 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 Do you guys ever think of that? Yeah. Amen. And it's just an awesome picture in, in my mind. And so... To answer that question here again, what is the song of Moses? What's the song of Moses? Revelation 15 calls it the song of the Lamb. They're parallel. They're parallel stories. Exodus 15 and Revelation 15, they're parallel stories. Exodus 15, they're standing right next to a body of water, the Red Sea. In Revelation 15, they're standing right next to a body of water. This time it's the sea of glass. But they're singing the same song. They're singing the song of victory. They're singing the song of salvation. Do you guys understand? That's the song of Moses and the Lamb. And one day we'll be singing the song of Moses. I can't wait for that day. I can't wait. And so that's what the song of Moses and the Lamb is. It's the song of victory. And just as Moses are, was their captain for the children of Israel, and he led them to freedom. He led them to salvation. So Jesus is going to be our captain one day, and he's going to lead us to the promised land. And so these are, these are parallels in the book of Revelation. So... Uh, Oh, man, so it's so important to understand what these are and what these concepts are in Revelation and what the Song of Moses is. Verse 5, I want us to look at very closely. Revelation 15, verse 5. Are you guys still with me? Revelation 15, verse 5. The Word of God says, The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Try to say that five times fast, by the way. The tabernacle... (laughs) I can't even say it. The temple of the tabernacle... Oh, anyway. The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven... Temple of the Tabernacle of the Testament. Okay, here it is. What is the Temple of the Tabernacle of the Testimony in Heaven? Anyone, anyone else curious? What is that? 
Well, I just told you a biblical way to understand Revelation. When we look at Revelation and we have questions and we want to have a deeper understanding, where do we go to? The Old Testament. Would, would, you, would you guess that the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony is mentioned in the Old Testament? Absolutely. And so if you do some search, and I just kind of went ahead of you and did some research for you, but I want to give them to you here, okay? If you're a note taker, take these down, because I'm going to go through them kind of fast. Exodus chapter 25, verse 21. Here's the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. Here it is right here. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. So what do we see so far? We see... The ark, and inside the ark is this testimony or the law, and the mercy seat is right above it. You guys with me? Okay, for more clarification, we have Exodus 30, verse 6. And you shall put it before the veil, before the veil is another word to say, put, uh, to say, inside the veil, by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet you. Where did God meet his people? In a very special place, right? Okay, some of you guys are getting it already, amen. And then there's one more, I just want to show you, Numbers 1, verse 53. But the Levites shall pitch round about the tabernacle of the testimony, and there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel, and the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. Okay, we put all those three together. I just did some fast forward research for you. We went from Revelation to the Old Testament to understand Revelation. And where do we get? What is the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony? What is that? Someone said it. That's right. That's right. So, so listen, guys. This is holy ground. I, 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 don't, I don't even dare like talk about this lightly. This is, and I appreciate the choir singing about the holiness of God. This is the holiness of God. Mentioned right here, it's in the most holy place. The place that only one person, the high priest, could go once a year to be in the presence of God. And even that day, if they were not right with the Lord, what happened to that high priest? You guys know? And so when we talk about the most holy place, we, we, we don't do so lightly. This is God's presence. This is His holiness that we're talking about. You, you, are you guys with me so far? So in Revelation 15, verse 5, it's talking about the holiness of God. But in Revelation 15, verse 5, we'll see something that maybe we have never seen before or maybe something that we've skipped over right here. I want you to see it, Revelation 15, verse 5. It's the last part of Revelation 15, verse 5. And John looks... John looks and he beholds this most holy place. He sees inside the most holy place. The, the, the place that only one person could see once a year, he's seeing it. Can you imagine? And he doesn't even have words to like describe it. He's seeing the most holy place. And he's trying to like wrap his mind around it. That's why in verse 8 he said, And that room was filled with the glory of God. That's all he could say about that, that most holy place. And he's talking about this, he's talking about this place that's, that's so awesome. He doesn't have words to say. You know, uh, when I was in Israel for three months, it, I tell you, my eyes were so open and I was able to be at places and see places that uh, I'm, I'm just so grateful to, to, to see. And I go back and I'll tell my wife, babe, man, when you see, the, when you see that empty tomb, it's just so amazing. Or, or you go by the Sea of Galilee, where, where the very place where Jesus taught the Beatitudes. Or, or, or maybe you're on top of, like, I got to be on top of Mount Carmel, where Elijah uh, asked God to send down the fire. I was on top of those places. And she's kind of looking at me like, okay, that's nice. Because until she sees it for herself, they're just words. They're just words. John got to see inside the most holy place. And then in verse 5, he says, he says this, watch this. He says, the testimony in heaven was opened. Now, you might have read that and never thought about that, but as you're looking at Revelation 15 and verse 5, you say, man, that was open. There was, th- there was only one time that a year that the priest could go in, but now it's open for all to see. And there was only one time in Scripture where, where the most holy place was open for all to see. Does anyone remember that time? When the most holy place was open for all to see. Does anyone remember? Yeah. Now we're doing Bible study now, right? Revelation 15 verse 5. Now we're looking at another place in scripture. You know where that place was? I'll tell you right now. It's in Matthew chapter 27. The description 
of the veil. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks were split, and then the veil was torn. You can see inside the most holy place. Two times now you see in Scripture. The only two times in Scripture where you see the most holy place is open for all to see. It's in Matthew 27 and it's Revelation 15 where you see the holiness of God. And what do we see when we see the holiness of God? What do you see? Please stay with me, guys. Please stay. I know we're going through some theology here, but please stay with me. We're, we're going to see the holiness of God. And what is, that, what is that holiness of God? And it's this. If you see inside the most holy place, you see the presence of God, you see the message of the Bible. You have judgment and you have mercy. When you see the holiness of God, you see the most holy place. You see God's judgment, but you see God's grace. You see in the holy place, you see that testimony. You see the law. You see that God wants to deal with sin, but you also have the mercy seat right above it. Why? Because the message is that God's grace is always greater than our sin. Ravi Zacharias, I love listening to him, and one time he said, to his congregation or to the audience that day, he said, hey, what's more important, the right wing or the left wing on a plane? What's more important? And, and the people obviously chuckled and said, oh, yeah, of course, both of them are. And he says, and so it is with God. Please understand this. So it is with God. With God and his holiness, you have to have one plus one is two. You can't just have God as the judge. And you can't just have God as a God of grace. If you want to see God's holiness, you have to have both wings on the plane. He is judge, but he's also mercy. He's judge, but he's also grace. You guys with me? And take any of those two away from each other, and it's not the same. God is judge. He must deal with sin, yet he is merciful. There is a time that he will... There were a time that pardon will be finished and he will close the books yet that hasn't happened yet and those books are still open for people to come in he is both judge he is grace he is judge he is mercy that's the holiness of God my favorite author says this we dishonor God when we think of him only as a judge ready to pass sentence upon us and forget that he is a loving father The whole spiritual life is molded by our conceptions of God. And if we cherish erroneous views of His character, our souls will sustain injury. We should see in in God one who yearns toward the children of of men, longing to do them good. All through the scripture, God is represented as one who calls, woos by His tender love, the hearts of His erring children. No earthly parent could be as patient with the faults and mistakes of their children, as is God with those he seeks to save. Amen. You guys see what she's saying here? This is so, so important. The, your view of God, the way you view God, that's why we're talking about God today. Your view of God as only judge, if, you're, if you view God, I should say, if you only view God as just judge, she says that's an erroneous view. It's false. It's the wrong way to view God. And many have been hurt by that kind of teaching. Many have been hurt by by the kind of teaching that, that thinks of God as like this scary God. Yes, He's holy. Yes. He's a God that judges. Yes. But He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. He's both of those things. That's His holiness together. Amen? He is judge and he is grace. And it's so important how we view God, church, because how we view God ultimately affects how we view ourselves and ultimately affects how we treat others. I've met too many Adventists that are, quote, good Adventists, but they're terrible Christians. And I'd say to us as Hinsdale Philam, let's pray to God that we have a better picture of Him. Because when we see God as a God of judgment, yes, but we see Him as a God of mercy, yes, it's going to affect how we think of ourselves and it's going to affect how we treat others. And we'll be more patient with people. You know that spirit of like, that self-righteous spirit that thinks that, 
man, you're better than others or you're more righteous than others. That's not a spirit of God. God is judge, absolutely. But God is also mercy and he is grace. And how we view God is how we view ourselves and how we treat others. And I think that's why Jesus especially was close to sinners and, and why he was always rebuking the religious leaders. It's because he knew that when, when, when sinners got it and they learned to love God more than they loved their sin, when sinners got it, man, those were the people that he, were gonna, he was going to send them out and they were going to be able to reach others for him. And so he especially got close to them as a God of, a, he was a, a friend of sinners, right? As Jesus was called. And, and, you know, if we are to see God as both judge and grace today, and I pray, that you, I pray that this is clear, if we see one plus one equals two, if we see both sides of that plane today, judgment and grace is His holiness, then I believe there are some implications. Brace yourselves. We're going to bring this home. Number one, again, how we view God directly affects how we view ourselves and how we treat others. Number two, Let's be careful in making judgment on others if we're not on the side of mercy. If there's judgment, there's always got to be mercy. Amen? Amen. In fact, that's not my idea. Uh, Letter 16 from uh, from 1887, my favorite author says, If we err, let it be on the side of mercy rather than on the side of condemnation. Can we take a good look at that quote right here, please? If we err... Let's err on the side of mercy rather than the side of condemnation. Church, I pray that we'd be a people that are known to be people that have mercy. Be people that have patience with others. Be be people that are slow to judgment. Amen? Amen? And let's err. If we're to err, let's err on the side of mercy rather than on the side of condemnation. And it will be a church that knows how to love those who Christ misses the most. That we are a people that know how to love those who Christ misses the most. I don't know if we can get the whole thing on the screen. It might have been wrong, but it, if we can get the whole thing, it says, Heaven is waiting. Just listen to it because it's not there. Heaven is waiting and yearning for the return of the prodigals who have wandered far from the fold. Many of those who have strayed away may be brought back by the loving service of God's children. Man, what a promise. That many who have left, these people that Christ loves, that misses the most, many who have left, by by the church learning to embrace them, by the church learning to love them, many can be brought back home. And I don't know about you, but I have a lot of friends and even family who I would love to see back in church, who I would love to see back and connected with God, back to the Word of God. I would love to see. I have people, and I bet in a room this size, I bet you do too. You know, I have a very, very good friend. His name is Ram. He's actually from Chicago. He's a Cuban guy. But I met him in Miami. And when I started my uh, ministry in Miami, he came to the office one day. And in his own words, he was high as a kite. (laughs) I won't tell you all the substances that he was on that day, but I will remember that day as if it was yesterday. He's a very, very close friend of mine. His name is Ram. This is his picture. I don't know if you can see it clearly. That's me, by the way, also with him on that bike. And when he came to me, he was high as a kite. Yet... He was struggling so much that he was in tears. And I remember Ram saying to me, Glenn, I just don't know what is up with my life. I'm about to lose my job because of my substance abuse. I'm about to lose my family. I'm about to lose all these things. And someone told me, hey, go see the pastor. (laughs) And here I am, 28 years old at that time. What do I have to say to this guy? But he came to me week after week after week. I didn't do a, uh, like a, 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 I mean, we talked about the Bible. I didn't do like a, like a, like a systematic Bible study with him. I didn't 
I didn't, I didn't do like a, a series with him. I just, I went through some scriptures as they came. I went through some studies as they came. And he, week after week, he started coming and he started sharing me with his life. And I started listening to his story and just giving him hope from the word of God. And let me tell you, this man in front of my very eyes started to change as he came week after week after week. He started to change. Not only did he start to sound different, but he started to be a different person person at home and his wife noticed and he started to love his wife more he started to spend more time with his kids he started to love his kids more and let me tell you one of the greatest moments in my whole ministry was when I got to baptize this guy and I baptized his wife and you know what before I left twice he came up to preach with me and he shared the pulpit with me. And he told his testimony of how God has changed him and from the inside out and how God has made him a new man. And no longer is he controlled by those substances. Now he is controlled by the Spirit. Amen. Wow. I always invite him to come back to his hometown. His, he grew up uh, more in the inner city, but he, uh, one day if he comes here, I'll bring him to this church. I'll introduce you to him. But let me tell you, Ram is just an example of what it's like out there because I know that God is working on hearts today. If we believe that the end is near, like we talked about in the beginning, if we believe that the end is near, then I believe that the Holy Spirit is out there knocking on hearts right right now. And if we pray, and if we love, and if we pray, and if we we come a place that's ready, that's ready, to receive those that are far from Christ. If we become a place like that, Hinsdale Phil Am, we better expect that God's going to bring them here. And when they come here, are we ready? Are we ready to receive them? Are we ready to love them? Are we ready to show that kind of grace that He has for them? I, I, uh, I was uh, reading... As I told you, my heart was there last weekend. And I was reading about Hurricane Irma and what it's doing in Florida. And I was reading the Chicago Tribune. And as I was reading the Chicago Tribune, this article caught my attention. I know you can't see it, but it's September 13, Chicago Tribune. And it's after Hurricane Irma came. And this is what the headline says. It says, it's a nightmare of traffic for many returning home. So they were told to evacuate, and many millions and millions of Floridians evacuated, and they went up north, they went wherever um, wherever they could find shelter, but they're trying to come back, and they're on I-75, and I-75 is a parking lot, and there's no gas anywhere, and people are on the side of the streets, they're sleeping in their cars, and it's so difficult to come back home. They're they're told now they, they can come back home, but it's so difficult for them to come back home. And I don't know if you're picking up where I'm laying, what I'm laying down right now, but as I was... Uh, Reading this article, I kept thinking to myself, what about us? Like, we, I think we say that, hey, yeah, we would love to have these people come back. Or, or people who are far away from Christ, yeah, c- c- come on back. I, I think we're, we have good intentions we say that. But sometimes I think we have made it difficult. <coughs> we have made it difficult for people to actually come back home. And maybe, maybe we had so much expectation that, no, no, they've got to change first. No, 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 they're, 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 the way they think has got to change first before they come back. Let me remind you of Luke 15. The only change that the prodigal son had to do was just turn around and come home. It's nothing that those who are far away from Christ have to do except come back to Jesus. And when they come back, God's love is what changes hearts, isn't it? God's love is the only thing that can change this broken heart and this evil heart. God's love is the only way that anyone can change. And so let's not make it difficult for anyone to come back home. In fact, let's be as accommodating as we can as a church. When we see, when we see people and they're answering that call of Christ to come back home. Let's be a people that are welcoming, that have arms wide open and doors wide open for people like Ram to come back home. I want us to be a church that loves 
people like that. I want us to be a church that, yes, yes, we teach one day about uh, there's going to be a judgment day, absolutely, and the judgment is going on right now. That's what we're known for that, right? We got that part down. But what about that part that's full of grace and that's full of mercy and that talks about the love of God? How are we doing there? Let's be a church that talks about the true holiness of God, His judgment and His mercy. And if we are to be those kind of people, man, God's going to do something in us and in this place. And it's going to be for his glory. Amen.